welcome everybody so very much to the first annual or first ever exploratory summit for Citizens for Global Solutions. My name is Rebecca Shute and I'm the CGS Executive Director to welcome us here today and kick off proceedings before I follow with some housekeeping. We have Matt McDonough, the Executive Vice Chair of CGS's board and the Chair of our Development Committee. So without further ado, I'll give the mic to Matt to welcome everybody. And also, I will say, chair of the Citizens Global Solutions Action Network. And um, I would like to uh, uh, welcome everybody to this, our first annual summit, our first annual advocacy summit. Um, let's see. For the past 75 years, CGS has advocated for a governed world from um, Albert Einstein to Oscar Hammerstein to Walter Cronkite. Its offices and members have educated generations and promoted the idea of a democratic federation of nations. Today, with the aid of a distinguished panel, we will explore the advocacy of certain issues. Those will include uh, international institutions, international law and treaties, climate, disarmament, and youth engagement. Uh, CGS is no stranger to these topics. Uh, we have been promoting the United Nations and strengthening the United Nations since our inception. Um, and we have we were instrumental in the uh, beginnings of the International Criminal Court. We were instrumental in the beginnings of the Law of the Sea Treaty. Um, we were um, an early organizer of the McCloy Zorin Accords, which was in 1961. The McCloy Zorin Awards have formed the foundation for all of the um, disarmament, nuclear and general disarmament between the United States and the Soviet Union, going all the way back to 1961. And we were instrumental in developing that. So we touch on each of these topics. We have in our past touched on each of these topics and it's our plan to explore them further in the future. And uh, that is the purpose of our gathering here today to explore some of the advocacy ideas um, with our panel. And with that, I will turn it over to our newly appointed executive director, Rebecca Shute. Rebecca? Thank you so much, Matt, and uh, apologies for being remiss not to mention your role as chair of the Action Network. Um, before beginning uh, and looking forward toward the future, I think it important also uh, to look to the past and recognize that while we gather here virtually through the magic of Zoom, I'm coming to you from CGS's Washington headquarters, which sits on the unceded ancestral lands of the Anacostan people. In terms of a little bit of housekeeping before we get started with our very rich agenda, this session is being recorded and will be made available on YouTube on CGS's website and on that, that of our partners. As you can see, only panelists currently have their, um, their cameras on and have that capability throughout the program. Anyone who would like the recording, it will be sent out to every uh, email that registered for this session. And if there are any additional requests, please put those in the chat and we'll make sure that you get the recording. Q&A function will be at the bottom of your screen. You can address your comments and questions to an individual speaker um, by acknowledging that uh, that is the panelist that you want to um, uh, direct your comment or question toward or to the panel as a whole. We will put the agenda in the chat as well as I see there is already a question for that. And if you wish to make remain anonymous when your question or comment is voiced, please indicate that as well so we can respect that wish. The question and answer will follow our four panelists um, with five topics. So we have quite a full agenda and we very much hope to get to any, everybody. Um, if not, please forgive us and we will try to get your questions and comments to the speakers as expeditiously as possible after the program. We also, toward the end in the question and answer period and discussion, we'll have a brief poll you will use a function at the bottom of your screen that my colleague will describe um, the technicalities of at that point. 
Um, before I introduce our illustrious speakers and the topics in which they will present, I will also just remind everybody that CGS is a membership driven movement. And what that means is programs such as this are made possible by membership dues and generous donations. You can become a member on CGS's website. My colleague will put the link into the chat and you can also make a donation of any size that you so wish. I see that at least one of our participants has let us off with introducing themselves in the chat function. Please feel free to do so if you feel comfortable so that we know who's in the room. We're very delighted to have such a full audience today. With that, it remains my ultimate privilege and honor to introduce our four panelists. Um, first, we have Augusto Lopez Claros. Augusto is the senior fellow for the School of Foreign Service at Georgetown University. He's the former director of the Global Indicators Group at the World Bank, as well as the director of the Global Competitiveness Program at the World Economic Forum. He is an international economist with more than 30 years of experience, and we have been delighted to have him and his co-authors as our most recent authors in the CGS flagship book club, and we'll link to that in the chat as well to discuss their very important work, global governance and emerging global institutions for the 21st century. We have our final book club session to discuss that work coming up on July 8th. Once again, we'll include these links in the chat. Second on our program is Ms. Kristen Smith. Kristen is the director of the Atrocity Crimes Project at the American Bar Association, which includes their International Criminal Court Project alongside other initiatives. Previously, she was the legal fellow at the Global Justice Center, and she was the Whitney B. Harris Crimes Against Humanity Fellow um, working on uh, at the World Law Institute. She is an alumna of Notre Dame University and Washington University of St. Louis. To my immediate right, we are welcomed all the way from Prague by Mr. Alan Ware. Uh, Alan wears a number of hats. Um, he's a peace educator, campaigner, expert in nonviolence, nuclear abolition, international law, gender and children's rights and the environment. He is the director of programs for uh, the World Federalist Movement Institute for Global Policy, as well as the co-founder of Parliamentarians for Nuclear Nonproliferation and Disarmament. Um, I am cutting some of your many accolades short in the interest of time, Alan, I hope you'll forgive me. And lastly, we have Jacopo de Marineris, Marinis, excuse me, Jacopo, um, who joined CGS um, in September 2022 as our social media coordinator and as a youth engagement expert. He led our delegation this year to the Global Futures Forum. He is a recent graduate of the University of Illinois at Ur Urbana, and he co-founded a number of student chapters while there, including the Chicago Peace Act Action Network, and spearheaded several initiatives, both locally, nationally, and internationally aimed at peace, human rights, and equality. Um, he's been published in numerous journals and periodicals, including Counterpunch and uh, the LA Progressive. And you can see more of his work on CGS's website if you visit our resources page. So with that, the order of our presentations is that Augusto is going to kick us off, speaking about supporting international institutions. And then we'll hear from uh, Kristen Smith on international uh, legal order, um, including treaty-based law, Alan on climate uh, justice and disarmament, and finishing off with Jacopo on youth engagement. So I see the floor to um, Augusto, please, to kick us off. Uh, thank you very much, Rebecca. It's a pleasure to be um, uh, participating in this uh, in this conversation with you and your colleagues. Um, let me start out by <clears throat> establishing what I think is a very important principle. And this was actually laid out uh, by someone whose vision of global order back in the 1930s and 1940s was very much aligned with the with the spirit of what the World Federalists were trying to were trying to achieve in the in the following decades. Um, his name was Shoghi Effendi, and he was the head of the Baha'i community at that time. And he he said something which I thought was always very very insightful. He said, "This is 1931. He's surveying the the uh, sort of the devastation brought about by the by the Great Depression, not just in the U.S. but you know elsewhere in other parts of the world as far." as far away as Australia. And he said the, the fundamental cause of uh, world unrest is our failure to adjust our system 
of economical and political institutions to the imperative needs of a rapidly evolving age. He was essentially saying that in a world which is constantly in a process of change and transformation, um, our institutions which underpin the ways in which we collaborate internationally have to be flexible and have to adjust to these, to these changes so that they can be responsive and effective. And when we fail to do this, when we freeze our institutions in time, um, or when we uh, don't build up the institutions that we need you know, to deal with particular problems, uh, climate change comes to mind, then what happens is that we basically enter into a period of instability where increasingly we face you know, what I would call global catastrophic risks. Um, and I think this is very much the, the, the time that we're living in. Let me just give you very quickly two, two or three examples. Um, all of them I'm sure you, know, you are familiar with. Um, as you know, in, in increasing ways, the scientific community is, is alarmed by what is happening on the climate change side. I was particularly perturbed to read a report last October from the United Nations Environment Program, where they say that there is no credible path to one and a half degrees um, centigrade in place. And therefore that the only thing that we can actually uh, uh, do now is to avoid the most catastrophic impacts of the climate crisis. And this would require the rapid transformation of societies literally within the next uh, few years, which is of course a very tall order. Um, you know very well that in recent decades, we have seen a very rapid unraveling of our nuclear order. Um, it, the United States withdrew from the anti-ballistic missile tri treaty in 2021. Last year, Russia um, said that it was going to withdraw from the New START treaty. And, and the one cornerstone uh, that we have in this area, the non-proliferation treaty, uh, which is comprehensive in coverage and has been signed on by the vast majority of your countries, um, it's not really working, you know, it has an article, Article 6, which calls for the, for the, you know, for countries to pursue negotiations in good faith on effective cessation of the nuclear arms race leading to a nuclear disarmament, but in fact we're doing exactly the opposite. We, we are expanding and modernizing our arsenals last year, no, I'm sorry, 2021, the nuclear power spent in the middle of COVID you know, something like $82 billion, you know, modernizing our, our, our arsenals. And then one last example, um, the World Bank uh, in 2022 uh, said that we have seen the largest increase in global inequality since World War II. And, you know, this is obviously very perturbing because it, it is a well-established fact uh, that there is a very direct connection between income inequality on the one hand and political instability on the other. I come from Latin America and I can tell you, take it from me, uh, this is the economist speaking, um, there are a number of countries in the region that are becoming increasingly ungovernable. And I think one of the reasons for this is basically you know, the, the widening gaps uh, between the wealthy and the poor and, and these inequities basically are making societies very brittle and very, very difficult to, 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 to govern uh, from a you know, social and political perspective. Um, much of the debate about, about you know, supporting international institutions um, has taken place in recent, in recent decades in the context of the United Nations, which is the cornerstone of this, uh, of this system, the, you know, sort of the global order that emerged after the San Francisco conference in, 19, in 1945. Um, <clears throat> I don't have time now to say more about some of the reforms that are also necessary in some of the supporting institutions. I have just written a paper on IMF reform in the 21st century. The IMF is a very, very uh, substantial uh, uh, part of our, of our sort of system of multilateral institutions that are underpin our global order. Um, but, you know, this is a brief intervention and maybe that's a subject for another time. But, but essentially, one of the frustrations uh, about the whole debate about reform of the UN system and its supporting institutions is that a lot of the debate takes place, you know, 
in the context of perceptions of what is politically feasible rather than that which is desirable. And so when the debate goes uh, uh, on the feasibility side, then, then, then it, it impoverishes the debate because very quickly you discover that, that researchers, thinkers, policymakers are very wary of making recommendations that I would actually make a difference in terms of creating a new, a new global order. And so what happens is that we do tinkering at the edges. You know, we, we move the chairs in the sinking ship, uh, so to speak. And, and this ultimately leads, leads nowhere. And so it seems to me that this debate um, in the spirit of, of what the World Federalists were doing you know, 50 years ago, you know, should focus, especially given the, the dire circumstances in the planet at the moment, on what we actually need to do to make a difference. Um, whether this is perceived in the short term as being politi politically feasible or not, I think is another matter. What sometimes something that is not politically feasible today can quickly, if circumstances change, become politically feasible you know, very shortly th thereafter. I could give you many examples from history that, that actually uh, uh, make that a true statement. Um, <clears throat> I'm looking at my watch. I have two to three more minutes. Here, you know, the, the, the agenda obviously is very, very wide. Um, in the book, uh, Global Governance and the Emerging Global Institutions for the 21st Century, which Rebecca mentioned, we have focused uh, on issues such as how can we empower, empower the General Assembly you know, to, to uh, essentially become a more effective uh, organ um, and to perhaps uh, begin to, to uh, sort of be empowered to do legislation that is binding on member countries, at least in some narrowly defined areas. Um, you may have noticed that, that the, the locus of power and influence is actually shifting from the Security Council, which is completely dysfunctional, you know, increasingly towards the General Assembly. A very good example of that was what happened last year after the Russian invasion of Ukraine. The resolution in the Security Council was vetoed. It quickly moved to the General Assembly, uh, where it was strengthened in terms of the language and then was approved by 141 countries. Um, I am of the view that the veto has become very quickly a nearly worthless privilege. Um, it didn't help Russia very much. They vetoed the resolution and it didn't prevent NATO and other UN members to assist Ukraine to defend itself against Russian aggression. So, so my, as an economist, I can tell you that when the value of something comes down to close to zero, it is on its way out. Uh, so, <clears throat> I think that uh, we should strengthen the democratic legitimacy of the UN system uh, through the creation of World Parliamentary Assembly. We should look into issues of funding the UN system in a, in a, in a more rational way. Um, I think we already have a very interesting, very good example, which is how the European Union funds itself. They have independent sources of income. Um, a fixed percentage of value-added taxes and custom duties go directly to the, to the European Union budget. We should think creatively about, about you know, strengthening the, the, the spending capacity of the United Nations system, which at the moment is very, very limited because member, members don't see their, their contributions as an obligation of membership. And perhaps to conclude, I think that if the Citizens for Global, Global Solutions could contribute to the debate about um, an Article 109 review conference in, in the near term of the UN Charter, and that would be a great contribution. I think that um, there is some expectation that perhaps we have come to a moment in history when um, we need to rethink uh, the, the UN Charter for the 21st century. The UN Charter is a frozen document. It hasn't changed uh, uh, at all in, in 78 years. And because of these risks that we face collectively, I think that it is high time that we have to rethink our, our global order in, a, in an ambitious way. Thank you, Rebecca. Thank you so much, Augusto, for packing so much in and being so responsible in terms of your timing. You ended with exactly where I hope each of our panelists will conclude their presentations, which is what can CGS and like-minded organizations do at action points? I think we might need to change the speaker view um, as we move over to our next panelist. 
Um, as food for thought, um, before we end the Q&A later, um, Augusto, I know you're very intimately familiar with the principles of Democratic World Federation. And if you have any guidance for us on, um, in addition to the Article 109 conference, how we can use our, um, uh, our representation at the United Nations and our advocacy platforms to further support reform of the institutions we so deeply care about. With that, I will give the floor to Kristen Smith, who is going to talk about um, legal, uh, the existing legal um, uh, international law treaty background and opportunities to support international legal institutions. Kristen, please. Thank you. Um, and I'll ask Drea to get my presentation up. Okay, perfect. Um, so thank you so much for having me. It's great to see, especially in the chat, to see so many people from around the country who are um, interested in these issues and um, so excited to talk about them today. Um, I was asked to speak about promoting justice and accountability through treaty-based international law. Um, so I'm going to focus on two particular opportunities, which are the International Criminal Court, uh, including the U.S. ICC relationship, and then also crimes against humanity, because those are two issues that are I, where I, I see particular opportunities right now. Um, uh, disclaimer, I'm speaking in my personal capacity, not on behalf of the ABA necessarily, where I get to do this wonderful work, but I'm speaking from my, my own experience working on advocacy on these issues. Next slide. There we go. Okay, so I wanted to start with the International Criminal Court. Um, you know, CGS, members of CGS are uh, most likely quite familiar with the International Criminal Court, given the organization's um, historical involvement in its founding, which is wonderful to read about. Um, if anyone is not familiar, here's just a few quick facts about the ICC. It is a treaty-based international court. It um, is founded through the Rome Statute, which was negotiated in 1998. The court became operational in 2002, and so now it's had several decades of work under its belt. And um, I think anyone familiar with the court can probably tell it's really picking up steam. It started with a few cases. They were very long. Now it has 17 open investigations in um, many different continents. So it really has turned into a global court. Um, there's five ongoing cases and trials right now in several of those situations. So, that, you know, those are some of the unique aspects of the court. Um, I think from my perspective, it's just always important to remember the ICC is kind of the cornerstone of a continually developing global system of international justice. You know, we have um, it was created after the ad hoc tribunals um, for the former Yugoslavia and Rwanda were created in the 1990s, both of those through the UN Security Council. And as um, Augusto you know, noted before me, the, the Security Council is really a different animal in terms of its functionality now. So it's not likely that more tribunals like that will be created. And so um, having a treaty-based court like the International Criminal Court that, although it doesn't apply in every situation around the world because, um, because of its kind of jurisdictional regime, it has a much broader applicability than just those situations. So, you know, that avoids the kind of cost in standing up a new tribunal all the time. Um, it, it closes the gap in terms of justice applying to different situations, although it does still have limited applicability because it's a treaty-based court. Um, some of the things I think are important, it's impact, it's strengthened norms on atrocity prevention and accountability, um, including encouraging states to domesticate these crimes in their national law, even though that's not a requirement of the Rome Statute. It's happened in many countries as a result of them signing up to the court. And then that's created kind of national um, units focused on atrocity crimes as well, which is a really positive development for the rule of law overall. I think it's also strengthened the expectation of justice with um, particular victim populations. Um, even if it's not always deliverable, the demand is a lot stronger and it develops jurisprudence. It creates expertise that then, you know, goes back to uh, people's home countries and um, can, as I said, can spur kind of national prosecution. So those are all things that are important about the ICC and why it has a larger impact on kind of the global legal order um, beyond its, its particular cases. Next slide.
So um, I just wanted to give a, a bit of background about the ICC in the United States, because that is an area in which um, I focus in terms of advocacy, um, you know, working for the American Bar Association, but also because there's a lot the U.S. could be doing more to support the court um, and isn't. And it, as I think a lot of people will be familiar, it's been a very tumultuous relationship. The U.S. was very involved in negotiating the treaty and its elements of crimes and things like that, but it's not a state party. So, you know, that's the ultimate goal, probably. But we have other other kind of advocacy targets in the short term to get the United States to engage more consistently with the court to support it and not undermine its institutions to kind of protect its independence and all those things. So, um you know, just there's the, the background of us participating, signing, but not ratifying the treaty. And then the low point, I would say, would be the last administration actually sanctioned the ICC prosecutor and members of um, and a member of her staff in seeming retaliation for an investigation that they opened into crimes in Afghanistan. So that was a low point. It's gotten better under this administration, but it, there's still a lot of policy disagreement within the U.S. government in terms of how involved the U.S. should be. Uh, next slide. So how does this play out in practice? Here are some examples of kind of positive U.S. engagement with the court on the left and then negative engagement on the right. So, you know, they've attended attended meetings. They've assisted in transferring two fugitives to the court, which are really interesting stories, if anyone wants to look those up. Uh, we have the United States of the War Crimes Reward Program. Um, they've provided support for particular witnesses in certain cases. They've been involved in UNSC referrals of cases in the past, although, as we've noted, those are much less likely now, given kind of the, the form veto that um, Russia and China place over referrals to the International Criminal Court. Uh, but there's lots of ways that the U.S. could be supporting, either in these ways or beyond. And then on the right, you'll see kind of the negatives in, in the relationship over the years, negative expressions at the U.N. or, per, or um, working to keep the International Criminal Court out of resolutions that deal with atrocity crimes, you know, sanctioning officials. And then um, it filtered into our relationships with other countries as well in the early 2000s. Next slide. And not to get too technical, but um, just so you, again, so you understand the context of this weird relationship, there's actually domestic U.S. law that prohibits certain forms of U.S. engagement with the International Criminal Court. So this has been a key part of at least our advocacy at the American Bar Association, um, the advocacy of, of groups in coalition like the Washington Working Group. Um, so, you know, there's kind of a broad ban on providing funding for the International Criminal Court. And then there's a specific law called the American Service Members Protection Act that prohibits all of these ways that the U.S. could engage. There's quite a big carve out called the Dodd, Dodd Amendment that says that none of those things should impact um, the U.S. ability to support uh, investigations into those accused of um, genocide, war crimes, and crimes against humanity that are foreign nationals. But how that has applied in practice is very murky. And so while the U.S. has kind of overcome these restrictions to cooperate in some situations, it still really limits the ways that they can engage. Last year, Congress removed some of these restrictions, pretty much all the restrictions in terms of um, engaging with the ICC's investigation in Ukraine, even though they, they aren't actually doing that <laughs> in terms of there's been public reporting that there's a disagreement in the executive branch about whether to share information with the court, despite Congress clearly saying that they can. Um, so, you know, those restrictions were removed in Ukraine, but that they still apply to other situations. So it's kind of created a Ukraine specific exception. Next slide. <clears throat> So here I just listed some of the challenges um, that I, I think I've encountered and other advocates have as well. Um, the, the legal framework is a mess as I tried to just kind of preview. Um, there's kind of this idea of case by case support that is the has been the kind of US policy. They engage when they want to, but not as a as a rule. Um, and you know, the ICC as an institution is concerned about um, perceived at being perceived as political you know, being influenced by by states supporting certain investigations over others. So that's kind of a conflict in terms of policy. There's a real lack of, trans of transparency about how the U.S. engages, um, how they interpret those legal restrictions. 
there's not always bipartisan agreement. There has been on Ukraine, which has been really a positive and kind of a window for advocacy, but that's certainly not been the case in other situations that the ICC is working on. I think there's I think there's a big divide between public opinion, which is generally very supportive of the ICC as an institution and the US being more involved and policymaker opinion, um, which kind of has these concerns from the early 2000s that never seem to go away. <laughs> um, I think next slide. Just a reminder yeah. that we're at time, but I think we can spare about two more minutes if you wouldn't okay. mind moving along. Thank I'm you. Gonna, sure. I'll talk about crimes against humanity real quick then in two minutes. So next slide. Okay, I can, I'm happy to talk more about this in, in terms of questions, but these are some ideas that um, that I and other advocates have brought up in terms of specific forms of advocacy to increase the U.S. relationship with the ICC and just strengthen the role of international justice overall. Next slide. Okay, so very briefly, uh, I see um, that crimes against humanity is something else I wanted to raise that I think CGS should think about. Um, there's the domestic gap in terms of a crimes against humanity statute. We have um, we have law on war crimes, genocide, and a couple specific atrocity crimes. The War Crimes Act was just amended in 2022. So again, that was a great showing of bipartisan support to strengthen um, U.S. law on war crimes, but there isn't a crimes against humanity statute. So that's created a real gap in terms of when people come here and lie about their role in atrocities abroad, um, we don't have legal recourse to prosecute them for substantive crimes and end up, you know, trying to do it for immigration violations or just deporting them. And they're not always held to justice in their own country. So that's something that um, we've been really focused on. And there is there does seem to be interest building in Congress. So um, that would be an area to think about. And then I just want to talk about the International Convention real quick, and then I'll and then I'll hand it back. Um, the International Law Commission is part of the part of the UN General Assembly structure has been studying crimes against humanity for uh, quite a while since 2014. And um, they you know, identified the need for an international convention on crimes against humanity. Because as you know, there's the Geneva Conventions for war crimes, there's the Genocide Convention, but there isn't a standalone crimes against humanity convention. And um, so that process was kind of, they created, they adopted draft articles, um, states kind of took note of them and made comments for several years in the General Assembly, but it was quite stuck based on the, the consensus procedure until this past year. And now um, over the next two years, they've created kind of a special process in order to really get states to talk about their views. So there was a special session in April. There's gonna be another one in April of 2024. And in the meantime, states are, um, supposed to submit written comments by the end of this calendar year. So uh, this is really a good time for organizations if they're interested in encouraging that to engage, um, either raising raising just the issue and building awareness of it, doing legal analyses on specific parts of the convention. Gender is one, kind of the prevention obligations, um, how it's going to work in national law. Those are all areas that could really be fleshed out by organizations if they're interested. And then obviously engaging with states too, in order to encourage them to be supportive, to um, identify any disagreements and work them out and really move forward rather than have this um, wonderful effort and a really needed international convention be stuck in the, in the UN process. So that's another particular opportunity. Um, and I'll end there. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kristen. And thank you particularly. I think that we um, sometimes are inclined to think of uh, Rome statute ratification as um, all or nothing, that either the United States ratifies the foundational treaty of the International Criminal Court or not, and that there is no incremental work that can be done. Um, for point of reference, I always like to um, come back and acknowledge the fact that of the nine core international human rights instruments and their nine optional protocols, the United States has only ratified five, and that uh, leaves out important treaties such as the Convention on the Rights of the Child, which the United States is the only country in the world uh, that is not a state party to, um, or the Convention on the Elimination of Discrimination Against Women. 
Our next speaker has the challenge of trying to fit two, two topics, um, as if our, our last two were not challenging enough, um, into his um, discussion, his intervention. We have Alan Ware, who's going to speak on the uh, interconnected challenges of climate change and disarmament, a topic he will also be speaking at um, on our intergenerational panel on July 13th. So over to Alan. <clears throat> Uh, thank you very much, Rebecca. It's lovely to be uh, joining you today from the Citizens for Global Solutions office in Washington, D.C. Uh, so I'm the new program director uh, for World Federalist Movement, uh, and I also am working with other organizations such as Parliamentarians for Nuclear Nonproliferation and Disarmament and the World Future Council. Uh, as Rebecca said, I'll talk about uh, climate action, uh, also about disarmament, primarily nuclear disarmament, and then I'll talk about what we call the climate peace disarmament nexus, which is the interrelationship of those. Um, and the programs and initiatives that I'm talking about, you'll find most of them are either on the CGS program website or the WFM program website. Uh, but this gives you a little bit more um, background to some of them, and then hopefully, uh, you know, opportunities to ask questions and get involved. So I'm going to start off with a climate action, um, and I'll be talking about the International Court of Justice climate case, which is happening at the moment, primarily, a bit about the summit of the future, uh, Earth trusteeship and the trusteeship council, and a new alliance that we're building um, of civil society organizations in cooperation with like-minded states called MEGA, which is Mobilizing Earth Governance Alliance, to see how some of these environmental governance proposals, initiatives uh, can work together. So firstly, the International Court of Justice case on climate change. Um, this has just been requested from the UN General Assembly. Uh, it was a resolution adopted in March without any opposition, which was a big testament to the really important work done by the particularly the Pacific Island states, um, but also others that work together to get this question to the International Court of Justice, what are the legal obligations of states with respect to protecting the climate for current and future generations, and what are the obligations uh, to address uh, the impact that climate change has, particularly on impacted communities. Now, why is this important? Because uh, this climate issue is a global issue. It's part of like the global commons that's affecting everybody. And we're not going to be able to address this issue sufficiently only by working on a nation state basis. Even if we have a really good country that has put it in a very fast track uh, process for shifting from fossil fuel economy to a um, green uh, economy or renewable energy based economy, uh, th those countries won't be able to move ahead fast enough because if they are putting all the commitment, the expense into it, the cost there is to the economy, and their neighbors are not doing it, it puts them at a, at a com uh, competitive disadvantage which is why we see so many arguments when we're talking about advancing uh, uh, initiatives to cut back on the fossil fuels within the United States. The counter arguments here, but if we do it and China and Russia aren't, then it's gonna hurt our trade. We'll get at a competitive disadvantage to the others. So we have to work on this issue at a global level. It doesn't rule out working at a local level, city level, regional, state level, national level, but we have to have the global obligations and they need to be much stronger than what we've got in the negotiated process. Uh, and the negotiated process is that, it's a negotiated process. So you only get as far with the Paris Agreement and the COP as what countries will agree to. And that's not enough. We're already having catastrophic climatic consequences at 1.1 degree. It's gonna be even worse when we get to 1.5. We should not allow governments to, to, uh, to let climate change uh, in average increases up to two. That would be a disaster for the world. So that's why we need legal obligations at the international level, which will require stringent requirements of countries universally. And that's what this case is doing. And that's why it's so important to get engaged in it. The interesting thing about this case is that the International Court of Justice is opening up the case, not just to participation of states, but also to international organizations. They haven't really done that in the past. Normally it's just states who have the capacity to participate in the hearings. But the International Court of Justice, just in the last 10 days, has already announced that they will now authorize certain uh, intergovernmental organizations to participate. They've announced three so far, and they'll announce more. So it gives them much greater capacity to bring to the court both the stringent 
uh, obligations uh, and those under a wide range of law, because the International Court of Justice deals not just with treaties, but also with custom law, principles of international law, precedent, the teachings of experts. It really has the broad mandate to be able to bring everything to do with law re relating to the environment into its deliberations and into its decision. Um, also, this I think this is going to be the biggest case in the history of the court. It's had some important cases. The nuclear weapons case was really important. Uh, but this one, I think, will be the biggest. And it's not just about what the court says. It's going to be what happens after and how this is, is going to be implemented. So the engagement of civil society, experts, uh, governments, of course, uh, parliaments, uh, so we're hoping that the, the parliamentarians and parliaments will be involved in this as well, will ensure that when the decision comes down, it will then be effectively implemented. So uh, we're doing an event next week uh, up in New York, specifically on the ICJ case, uh, and we do have an online option if you want to uh, join, uh, and that's, at, that's uh, already up on, I think, the WFM website. Uh, so that's on legal aspects, but we also need governance aspects, which is really important. That's where the summit of the future is really important. And so the United Nations General Assembly, again, has, has decided it will hold a summit of the future in 2024 and a ministerial meeting in 2023. Uh, the General Assembly has said that the final document to be adopted will be by consensus. So we can't expect it's going to be a, a fabulous document that will be adopted. But with these summits at the UN, it's not just about what's adopted, it's about what momentum is generated for initiatives. So as well as what can be adopted in the final declaration, which we call the Pact for the Future, it's also important to bring like-minded groups together to advance initiatives. One of those, for example, is the idea of repurposing the Trusteeship Council, which is a bit dormant at the moment, uh, into something that could be uh, dealt deal, to deal with the global commons. Um, and that is a little bit easier in dealing with all of the environment. I mean, hopefully we'd get to that eventually uh, with perhaps an environment council to be established. But on the global commons, you've already got a possibility to be able to build global governance because it's already accepted that these are commons that aren't owned by any particular country. So that's where there's an opportunity. And the global commons include the climate, the oceans, the seabed, um, outer space. They're the key global commons. That proposal probably won't be adopted at the summit of the future, but there'll probably be enough traction developed, well, that's what we hope, that'll then feed into a, like a follow-up conference maybe two years later that could then establish it, or into a general assembly process resolution to establish uh, this repurposing the trusteeship council to address the global commons. And one of the initiatives which World Federalist Moon is involved in with some others is the idea of bringing the principles of trusteeship more into environmental governance. Trusteeship is basically the idea of a resource or an entity or, that is not owned by anyone, but is held in trust uh, for, the, for future generations and for the future environment itself. So the idea of earth trusteeship is now getting a lot of um, attention. Uh, we've just released a book this week uh, in Washington DC on the principles and examples of earth trusteeship. And this could help guide the Trusteeship Council, if it is repurposed to, uh, to um, focus on managing the global commons. Uh, so that's a bit on the, on the ICJ and the climate. <clears throat> I'm going to shift over now to the disarmament side. And one of the key areas uh, WFM is working on is nuclear disarmament. It's not the only, but I'm going to focus mostly on that because it is another area of existential threat to humanity, as the climate uh, crisis is also existential threat. Uh, so it's something which requires immediate action. And the programs that we're working uh, on include a few things. One, the first one is nuclear risk reduction, making sure we don't have a nuclear war by miscalculation, by accident, uh, by uh, uh, crisis escalation. Uh, and so we're working in partnership with PND, Parliamentarians for Nuclear Non-Proliferation and Disarmament. Our champion in the United States, uh, co-president, is Senator Markey. And so he has a number of initiatives in Congress. Uh, he also helped set up the Senate foreign relations hearings when President Trump was the president to sort of counter the presidential authority to start a nuclear war. So there are a lot of things that Senator Markey is running in the US Congress here as part of a working group on nuclear risk reduction and arms control that he set up that's got members in both houses. And with PNND, we've also got similar work in other parliaments. 
so that we can engage parliamentarians in joint initiatives, like the idea of getting all of the nuclear weapon states to agree to have no first use policies. Uh, China and India already have those, but the United States, France, Russia, UK don't. And if there was a no first use policy, it would greatly reduce the risk of a nuclear war and pave the way then for negotiating for nuclear disarmament. The second thing we bring to this is the idea of putting in a common security framework to nuclear disarmament. What this means is that we're addressing the issues that the nuclear weapon states and their allies have, some of the reasons why they have nuclear deterrence. They say they need it for their security to prevent aggression. So what we come in with says, look, there are alternatives. We have mechanisms for dealing with a threat or actual aggression in the UN Charter. We've got the International Court of Justice, the International Criminal Court. We've got regional bodies that can like address these issues. There are ways to replace nuclear deterrence with common security. One example is the Northeast Asian Nuclear Weapon Free Zone proposal, and you'll see that on the WFM website. It's called the 3 plus 3. The common security one means that you are addressing the security of all states. We're not just telling North Korea that they can't have nuclear weapons. We're also saying that Japan and South Korea should lower their reliance on nuclear weapons, and China, Russia, and the United States should lower their reliance on nuclear weapons in the region through a regional agreement. Um, and the final thing is looking at what would be the framework for a nuclear weapons free world um, and how would we achieve that and how could that also go hand in hand with sustainable development goals. So one of the proposals, and now I'm coming to the climate uh, peace disarmament nexus, one of the proposals is to bring nuclear disarmament into the next round of the sustainable development goals. It isn't in the current ones, uh, there was counter lobbying against it, but now we've got uh, a big momentum uh, led by Hiroshima, the Hiroshima governor, but others are involved uh, and include in the next round of the sustainable development goals, first, the aspiration for the complete elimination of nuclear weapons no later than 2045, the 100th anniversary of the United Nations. Um, and secondly, to immediately start cutting the money that's going into nuclear weapons, $100 billion a year. That's both the budgets, and investments in the nuclear weapons corporations and put that money into sustainable development, peace, et cetera. So we have a appeal for this. Oh, I appeal this one. Oh, uh, we the peoples protect people on the planet, appeal for a nuclear weapon free world. Uh, you can endorse this. This appeal is gathering signatures from all sorts of people around the world and we're presenting it to various UN bodies. It's on the Unfold Zero website. That makes the connections between disarmament and so climate security. And then as Rebecca says, we're going to go more into the connections between climate protection and nuclear disarmament, the connections between common security in the peace and security realm and protection of the global commons. They both have this need for cooperation between countries. We need law to, to ensure that and, and facilitate that cooperation. We'll be addressing that more on July 13th and July the 20th in the joint event we're doing. Uh, CGS and uh, Welfare Earth Movement, finding hope in the climate, peace and disarmament nexus. Thank you very much. Thank you so much Anne, for those very, very concrete recommendations. Um, we will put in the chat the link to the uh, We the People proposal that Alan just referenced for those to endorse. It is also on our website um, and we are very proud to partner with WFM IGP on the upcoming event and all of the campaigns that Alan just mentioned. And if you don't see something on our website, it's simply that Alan moves too quickly for us to upload it. Um, but hopefully by the end of your stay in the United States, we'll have all that up. Um, our final speaker is uh, Janko Demarinis, who is uh, a very proud member of the CGS team uh, since uh, late last year, 2022. Jakob is going to be speaking to the importance of empowering the next generation and strategies for intergenerational cooperation and all of the issues that we've heard discussed here today. Over to Jakob. Yep, so I'm just going to uh, screen share my screen. Can everyone see it? Yes. Perfect. All right, so yeah, as uh, Rebecca said, I'll be speaking about uh, mobilizing next generations through youth outreach and intergenerational approaches. So yeah, um, basically, um, in order to effectively drive youth outreach, uh, we should really endeavor to understand the priorities. And um, there are a lot of um, surveys and forums that um, have been used to demonstrate the priorities of, of use. 
uh, for example, the World Economic Forum's uh, Shaper Survey, um, which uh, interviewed, which surveyed more than 26,000 uh, youths, as well as the World Economic Forum's annual meeting in Davos um, in February, I believe, of this year, and the Global Futures Forum, um, the Youth Futures Series, and um, the forum's engagement with youths. And just, just so you know, the Global Futures Forum was a civil society-led conference from um, 20, uh, March 20th to 21st in New York. So all of these uh, surveys and these forums have established a fact that youths tend to prioritize climate change, artificial intelligence and technology, as well as civic empowerment, social justice, and they share a global mindset. So um, these are basically just some charts and images of the priorities uh, of use, climate change, conflict, you know, uh, poverty as well as an important one. And they also tend to be welcoming of, uh, of refugees. And not only is it important that we understand the priorities of use, but also their perspectives. For example, Sofia Bermudez, a youth leader at the Global Futures Forum, uh, was speaking out the importance of going from a place of consultation with young people, to young people actually being on the table and engaging um, with older generations um, in a way that shows, you know, that's equal, um, treating each other as equals. Um, furthermore, um, regarding the perspectives of youth, uh, Global Shapers community um, surveys have uh, established a fact that youths tend to be concerned about equity and inclusion um, regarding uh, age, gender, race, sexual, sexual orientation, and all other dimensions, um, socioeconomic status as well, um, as well as uplifting voices from the Global South and international governance, which the Global Future, Futures Forum did a great job of doing. Um, they also tend to be optimistic about the future and dedicated to radical action to protect the planet. And now, as we look, understanding the perspectives and the priorities of use, now we can um, better understand how to frame world fellowism in a way that really will attract use and use at organizations. Um, specifically, we should link world fellowism objectives to topics of concern to use. For example, we could ask ourselves regarding each of the following topics that I will discuss, how can democratic world fellowism effectively address this topic? Why is it the best pass? What World Federalist campaigns can be created regarding each topic? And how can use and use it movements get involved in and co-lead these campaigns? So the, the first one is obviously climate change, really important. Uh, around 70% of people between the ages of 60 and 25 are extremely or very worried about the climate. Percentage is even higher in many developing countries that are uh, most acutely feeling the impact of climate change. So how is world federalism connected to environmental justice and how can we effectively build coalitions with youth-led climate justice movements like Zero Hour, which was one of the most prominent youth-led uh, climate justice movements. Now I will spotlight Young World Federalists, which is a youth-led world federalist movement, um, is that they have, they tend to have these really great campaigns that connect topics of concern to youth to world federalism. For example, uh, the hashtag Save Earth campaign, which shows how world law is necessary um, and stronger global institutions are necessary to effectively protect the climate. So campaigns like that that really exhibit th those linkages between climate change and other topics and world federalism. And just the climate change. Um, and then international conflict, war and refugees, also topics of concern. So how do we how can we connect these topics? to world federalism? And how can we engage in coalition building with youth-led anti-war organizations like the centers? Um, and again, Young World Federalist has a great campaign, hashtag abolish war, that really makes the connection between world law and, um, and world peace manifest and, and obvious um, in that um, reducing militarism and establishing world law will, will help abolish wars. Artificial intelligence and technology um, is also something that is uh, really important to use. Uh, how can we ethically shape artificial intelligence before it's created? Um, and the Use Future series papers um, at the Global Futures Forum kind of demonstrated the, um, the importance of AI and emerging technologies to use. So if you want to check them out, um, you can go to the Global Futures Forum website. And how does World Federalism address these threats from AI and emerging technologies. I mean, you know, 
same question as before, how what campaigns can be created and how can, can we collaborate with suicide organizations like Use for Privacy? Okay, uh, civic empowerment, social justice, and global citizenship. Now, CGS has some really good programs that connect world federalism to civic empowerment and global citizenship, like the World Citizen Fellowship and World Citizen Club. So I, I suggest that you check those out on our website. Um, and and yeah, so how, how can we just build off of these programs to really connect um, and maybe create some campaigns to connect these principles to world federalism? For example, there's the Young World Fellows Campaign, uh, Make Earth Democratic Campaign, um, that does a good job of like connecting World Federalism to the idea of global citizenship that will appeal to youth. So now we get into intergenerational advocacy, specifically the model of intergenerational co-leadership. Um, so basically, intergenerational co-leadership refers to the importance of combining youth, fresh perspectives with older generations' experience and wisdom, standing basically with each other and um, viewing each other as equals. And I mean, it goes without saying that all generations contribute significantly to social movements um, from their accumulated experience, wisdom, uh, as well as the rich networks uh, built over, over the years with other activists, knowing how to get things done um, and their passion for civic engagement. Older generations, just like younger generations are necessary for the success of any social movement. Um, yeah. And then this is a really good uh, quote from the Interim People's Pact, which is an outcome document for the Global Futures Forum. Moreover, not only will humanity, including rising generations, benefit from intergenerational co-leadership, but it will also break down historical, historic conceptual barriers, build trust, and set an example for all that every member of the human family has the capacity to lead. Um, so that's, that's very important. Um, and then what does intergenerational advocacy look like? Well, for example, um, our upcoming, um, which I know other panelists and um, Rebecca has mentioned, the uh, our upcoming intergenerational panel event on July 13th and the 20th, which will feature um, intergenerational collaboration um, and activists from younger and older generations speaking about, um, about the climate uh, peace and its armament nexus, um, and as well as the Global Futures Forum and back in March, exhibited intergenerational advocacy in action that, you know, involving young people in the um, in the forum, in uh, the track work um, was very important. Uh, so it was really, um, really demonstrated intergenerational advocacy of everyone getting involved and treating each other as equals and respecting each other's perspectives. Um, now, moving forward, um, responsibility to future generations. Um, so this is, can be a good Another good perspective um, that we can adopt um, through our advocacy, um, basically placing future generations at the heart of our deliberations will assist in bringing the reality of world peace to the fore. Um, and that was again from the People's Facts for the Future from the Global Futures Forum. This is really important. Um, and you know, the majority of people in the US do feel a strong sense of personal responsibility toward future generations. Um, there's even an upcoming declaration for future generations to be drafted leading up to and announced at the UN Summit of the Future. So, um, so yeah, is that how, how can we um, engage in intergenerational advocacy in a way that respects the well-being and the rights of future generations? So turning talk into action. Now, what you know, first of all, this advocacy summit is a great um, first step um, to, to really um, appreciating the importance of youth outreach and intergenerational advocacy. Um, furthermore, there, as has been mentioned previously on July 8th, the special virtual strategy session um, regarding how to uh, apply World Federalist principles to our action. And just, yeah, when we, with our upcoming programs, we could think about how can we prioritize youth outreach, coalition building, and intergenerational co-leadership through our advocacy. And just, uh, finally, there's one thing that we should keep in mind regarding youth outreach is the importance of providing financial support. This will enable youth to actively participate in global governance. For example, um, the financial assistance from CGS enabled youth from CGS, um, like me, to attend Global Futures Forum in New York uh, back in March. And uh, Marina Jimenez Malgosa um, is also one of the CGS youth. She wrote a paper advocating for paid UN internships for youth. So this financial consideration, especially for young people who are strapped down by student debt is really, really important. 
And um, that's that's pretty much all. Um, and yeah, thank you for for listening to me. Thank you so much, Jacopo. And Jacopo, I think you were quite humble um, in failing also to plug some of the important scholarship and work that you've done on this topic um, in the form of organizational statements and policy papers that can be found on our website, including uh, Inter Alia, um, Intergenerational Dialogue and Cultural Heritage, and the important role that civil society and UN adjacent organizations can play therein. Um, we're about to go into our question and answer slash discussion period. We have a few keyed up. I'll begin um, actually just in chronological order with one that was um, addressed, um, well, I think actually can be directed uh, to both Alan and Augusto. And this was touched on a little bit in Alan's remarks. Um, the question comes to us, I really am pleased to acknowledge, in this case, the questioner uh, from Bruce Knotts, who is the incoming president of Citizens for Global Solutions and um, has introduced himself by a few of the many titles uh, that he currently holds in the chat. Bruce, welcome, and we're so glad to have you. Um, Bruce's question, um, again, for Augusto and Alan primarily, and of course, for any panelists who want to chime in, was about the proposal by the Parliament of World Religions and other entities that a trusteeship council on global climate change with oversight capabilities um, might be an effective avenue towards combating the um, transnational challenges, of course, that are faced by climate. I would add to that, and this I think harkens to Alan's comments on the nexus between disarmament and, um, and climate issues, that a similar proposal for a UN Council has been raised in the realm of peacekeeping. And I think, Alan, um, in your earlier remarks, you um, were uh, less than optimistic that the Summit for the Future might be where this is um, uh, effectuated, but optimistic that it might be an opening. Um, so I will go maybe to Alan first, um, because he is in my line of sight. And then if Augusto or anybody else would choose to comment on this, um, I will look for a raised hand. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Bruce, for the question, uh, and also to the Parliament of the World's Religions for putting forward this proposal into the Global Futures Forum, uh, where it was discussed and was picked up uh, as one of the proposals that are in the People's Pact for the Future. So there is uh, support from civil society for this proposal. Um, just to be clear, this is not the only international environmental governance proposal. Uh, you know, there, there are other ones. Um, and they can be complementary. I think I mentioned that like an environment council sort of modeled on the human rights councils also proposed. Um, and the environment council would differ in that it would um, be, uh, deal with all environmental issues. Whereas the proposal for the trusteeship council is to deal with the global commons. So it's a subset of, of environmental issues. Um, also, as you notice, the global commons aren't only about the environment. Uh, and so it's go, it's, these are going to intersect with the way they work, but that's, that's to be expected uh, when you have issues that have intersecting aspects to them. So personally, I think this is a really useful initiative. Um, it was in the report of the UN Secretary General as a possibility, uh, repurposing the Trusteeship Council. Um, it has an advantage of some of the other proposals in that the Trusteeship Council is already existing. Uh, it's there, it's part of the UN Charter. Um, all UN member states have a capacity to engage in it, so you don't have to create something from scratch, which means you could get it up and running quite quickly um, once the proposal gets traction to be adopted. As I mentioned, I don't think it's going to get enough traction to be adopted at the summit of the future itself, uh, but if there is a like-minded group of countries that picks this up and runs with it and builds support, then it's possible it could get established through the UN General Assembly. The Earth Trusteeship Working Group, which is established by Right Livelihood Laureates, the New Zealand Centre for Environmental Law and the World Future Council, uh, uh, is working on this particular initiative um, and is going to be holding an event later this year, which we'll let people know about, to explore in more detail um, how this might work, uh, the repurposing of the Trusteeship Council, how it might get established, and what is the political support for it so far. Uh, so watch the space. We'll get back to you and, and invite people to the event that we'll be running specifically on this topic. Thank you. And I think Augusto may have something to say as well. Um, thank you. Thank you, Alan. Um, 
My, my comment is just simply one uh, sort of that is purely practical in nature, okay? If I look at the UN Charter, I see that there are 18 articles, articles 73 all the way to 91, which deal with the international trusteeship system, all right? And let me just quote the relevant language. It's really two lines. Territories held under mandates established by the League of Nations after the First World War, territories detached from enemy states as a result of the Second World War, and ter territories voluntarily placed under the system by states responsible for the administration. So, you know, it's just pure, a purely practical suggestion. My, my, my own preference would be take Article 70 through 91 completely out of the, out of the UN Charter. Um, you know, it, it's essentially no longer operation. And then um, do we need uh, a system for management of the global commons? Of course we do. Uh, it's ab an absolute necessity, which I think your proposal, you know, very well identifies. Um, one of my colleagues in the Global Governance Forum, Arthur Dahl, has made a proposal in a paper which has actually been picked up by the high level advisory board on their report of a couple of months ago, which is essentially to create a, a new institution, something like a global environmental authority, which you can uh, design and, um, and you can identify the principles on which this organization would operate. We have done that in the past. We have created organizations to address uh, uh, issues of multilateral cooperation in particular areas. Um, we haven't done it on the environment, which is the reason why um, the system is not working. The Paris Accord is a failure. We are not delivering on the, on the uh, um, emissions uh, uh, goals implicit in that agreement. Um, but I am fully in favor of the motivation behind your proposal. Um, I think we absolutely need to do something on the environment. As you know, the UN Charter is completely silent on that issue. Thank you. Thank you, Augusta. And if I might keep you um, in the hot seat just a mo moment longer, I think this leads very nicely into another question that we had um, coming from Justin Hamer, um, which is what would an Article 109 conference look like? Um, could you expand on how you think that might um, uh, proceed and what you think of the current um, efforts by Club de Madrid and others towards um, substantive charter reform. And if I may use uh, moderator's privilege to just pack a little bit more on there yet, um, speaking of the veto power specifically, we've had rather a, a big year in terms of the evolution of the veto power with the passage of UN Resolution 76262, which um, uh, mandates a debate in the General Assembly every time the veto is used. We also have two proposals that have gained enormous traction, one led by France and Mexico, one by the accountability group um, that limits the veto in use, uh, the use of the veto and voting power in cases of atrocity crimes. <laughs> And those proposals have enormous backing, uh, one, I think, by 125 states and one by 104, I think, states and, and the two um, observing uh, members. So I wonder if you see any optimism here in terms of curtailing of the veto power in either complementary to or um, perhaps uh, in, in lieu of a full Article 109 conference, if that's for whatever reason unable to proceed. If you if you review the history of Article 109, it's, it's really a very, very fascinating, fascinating subject. Other word, Article 109 was exclusively introduced in the UN Charter because 17 countries at the San Francisco Conference, led by New Zealand, objected strenuously to the to the presence of the veto because they thought that they would basically um, impair the ability of the United Nations to deal with issues. Um, and problems, conflicts between the major powers and, and their allies. Right? So uh, to placate them and to get, get these 17 countries to actually support the UN Charter, there was this promise of, of a review conference, uh, but the motivation you know, was essentially you know, to perhaps re rethink the, the UN veto and then to adapt the organization to you know, changes in the, in the underlying, underlying situation. Um, so um, perhaps that explains the, the statement in the high-level advisory uh, board uh, 
uh, report which says a review conference focused on UN Security uh, Council reform. Um, you ask what would a 109 conference uh, look like? Well, <clears throat> I think that if we could approach this in stages, it would be great. If in the summit of the future, we could obtain a, an engagement, a promise, a, you know, to have a review conference sometimes in the, you know, in the next few years, hopefully, you know, well before 2030, because I don't think we have the luxury of waiting that long. You know, if out of the summit of the future, we could simply state, state the principle, yes, we will have a review conference, we will, we will open up a conversation about what kind of uh, UN charter do we need in the 21st century to bring the United Nations into modernity, into the, you know, the problems that we face today, that would be a great achievement. Then, you know, comes the question of what are the what are the changes that you need to do to the UN Charter in order to, to uh, generate the kinds of the kinds of modernization that you need within the within the UN system? And there, obviously, the subject is very vast. In fact, as you know, uh, Rebecca Arthur Dahl, Maya Groff, and I have written an entire book on uh, you know focus on that particular question: What are the changes that would modernize the United Nations and turn it into a problem-solving organization, which at the moment it isn't. Thank you so much. I'm, I'm going to move over to, to Kristen now. Um, and this question is also from Justin. And I apologize, Justin, I think I got your surname incorrect previously. It's Justin Hainer, not Hamer. Um, I'm not sure I fully understand the question, but it has to do with the sources of international law. So uh, four primary sources of law, treaty, um, custom, general accepted principles, and then beyond that, learned treatises. Um, so Justin's question is, given uh, that ICJ and other institutions um, accept customary law as well as multilateral treaties, um, could uh, they be, could principles I think contained within the uh, Rome Statute and Crimes Against Humanity, uh, nascent Crimes Against Humanity Treaty be considered binding on both signatories and non-signatories? And if this is something that could be, could apply to, um, uh, that could result from an article 1093 review conference. This might also be a question to Alan, given the, the Law Not War project. Um, but I guess it's on the, the principle, the sources of international law and the venues for, for considering those um, as applicable to non-party states, to treaties. Um, yeah, that might be a little outside my um, my expertise, but I will say in terms of custom, customary international law is um, a really interesting advocacy tool. It's um, I've even seen it used effectively in U.S. courts, you know, challenging like um, prohibitions on certain treatment under the Geneva Conventions, which, you know, kind of has been used to get around the nonsense of human rights treaties being non-self-executing in the United States and therefore their provisions not being effective. So customary law, international law, law is very interesting, but um, it, in order to be kind of used as a, a tool, you would need to, and a binding obligation, you'd need to show that it has um, state practice and then uh, the, that it's like that a norm is followed as a understanding of a pineal uris or like a legal obligation, understanding that it's followed because of a legal obligation. Um, so I'm not sure in terms of like a UN charter reform, if that would fit the bill ultimately, um, like again, it's kind of outside my area, but you know, in, in terms of like building that state practice and status of a legal obligation, um, just if I can pivot your question a bit, um, you know, things like a a new convention, that's where that is really useful. Um, so like the, the Crimes Against Humanity Convention that um, I was talking about, having a convention like that does like build and clarify the status of a norm in international law and the obligations that'll be placed on states. So um, something like that is really useful in terms of customary international law and those treaties can also create um, clauses in terms of where the obligations can be adjudicated, like at the International Court of Justice, which you've said, um, you know, so we've we've seen genocide cases go to the ICJ, and those have been really useful in terms of cementing that obligation as well. But um, it, I don't know; it might be a different animal in terms of the UN Charter, whether that you know has the same uh, kind of follows that interpretive interpretive vein versus a, a legal obligation, um, like in a substantive human rights treaty. 
Ellen, did you want to comment on that? I could add just a little bit to reinforce what Kirsten was saying because she's quite correct. It's a very high bar to um, to, uh, to achieve a customary international legal uh, norm. Uh, and practice is a really important part. The acceptance of principles is really important. So if you're applying this to like a change to the charter of the UN, I don't think you could say that it would have a, achieve a customary level of international law unless it reflected practice that was already taking place. So if the reform of the charter was along the lines of what we now have with the Liechtenstein resolution, that when there is a veto, then the, the, there should be a report on that to the General Assembly and the General Assembly can take that up. We're now already establishing practice of that through the, what the UNJ is doing. So if there was a reform of the charter that reflected that practice, you might say it's achieved a custody norm. But if it's a, if it's a reform of the, of the charter that hasn't uh, um, been uh, achieved experience and, and practice or general acceptance, then one state outside of it, you couldn't say it applied to them. The other thing one I also, I think, have to be careful of, and this is why there has been a lot of hesitance. I'm from New Zealand, and I know the reason why New Zealand you know, wanted to have the Article 109 uh, um, uh, clause in there. Um, but also, even amongst my own country, there's, there's caution about pushing too hard for charter reform if there's going to be serious opposition to a particular reform that's being pushed because you don't want to push a reform process that then might lead to some key countries deciding to withdraw from the UN itself. If they do not like the direction that a reform is going. So that's the one thing you have to balance up what's going to help to achieve a better UN, but also to ensure you keep the countries in the UN, because it's really important that we have countries within the UN so that we still have a capacity to engage on all the other aspects there. Thank you so much. I think Alan and Kristen, that tied it together perfectly. I have one um, final panelist question for Jacopo, but before doing so, I just want to acknowledge, I think we've gotten to almost all the questions in the Q&A. Um, one up top um, was, do, was a, uh, regarded a political question. I just want to emphasize that uh, CGS is a nonpartisan, non-political entity, so we don't comment on particular campaigns of individuals, um, as opposed to advocacy campaigns for causes. And then um, I think uh, Jane has led us off where we're going after the question for Jankopo with our poll is, uh, and her comment is there's no shortage of worthwhile global issues and governance initiatives. Which ones do you think can actually bring us closer to World Federation? So that's going to be um, ostensibly the poll question that will be put before you, um, just as a little bit of a preview. Um, so before we get there, um, one question for Jacopo that came from the audience. Um, please expand upon the statement that 70% of youth are in favor of radical actions to protect the planet. Do you have any specifics or any data points that might back that up? Yeah, yeah thank you for asking that question. Um, actually, I, I don't know. Um, I believe the fact was that 70% of, of use, um, I didn't include this in the PowerPoint, but 70% of use in, um, and there were 10,000 use surveyed, and of, of those 10,000, 70%, well, excuse me, 10,000 in 10 countries, and out of those 10,000 in 10 countries, 70% were extremely or very worried about the climate, um, and, and the majority of them um, are in support of, of action to, to save the planet, um, but it wasn't seventy percent are necessarily um, in in favor of radical action. Um, that wasn't exactly what the survey focused on. Um, but I, I do think that uh, if you look at you know the um, what youths tend to uh, tend to support, um, for example, the Green New Deal back in twenty nineteen, and a lot of a lot of youth, such as um, including Greta Thunberg, I believe, got behind the Green New Deal, um, and that is in a way radical action, but necessary action. Um, to, to to protect the climate and also to ensure just trans, just transition to green energy and clean energy. Um, so I do feel like um, majority of of youth do support radical action, uh, but I don't. Um, I wasn't referencing that in that particular survey. That was more about their perception of climate change. Thank you so much, Jacobo. I'm going to sneak in one more question that I think relates to to all of our panelists, actually, um, which is that there is a difference of opinions uh, opinion regarding how to use the rule of law to protect the environment. 
um, including climate change, of course, but other environmentally re related crimes. Now, Kristen, we were at a conference a couple weeks ago where we talked about the expert working group that suggested adding uh, um, a climate crime as an independent crime, not only a war crime under the Rome statute, there were pros and cons, including the fact that of jurisdiction that it's over individuals. Alan, you've obviously spoken to this at great length. Augusto, um, you also, I think, have um, given, given some systemic um, solutions um, with regards to the UN and Jacopo, you just uh, spoke on this from the youth perspective. If everybody could maybe come up with one quick um, uh, final thought on how the rule of law could protect the environment, that would be most appreciated. I also see that we have um, some requests to share materials that um, panel, uh, excuse me, participants have generated. If you could kindly put those links into the chat, we will make sure they are disseminated. Um, and then we will go into the final um, uh, element of this uh, panel, which is our polling. Um, so I will go over to whomever raises their hand or shows the inkling first among our panelists to answer the climate question environmental question. All right, Alan's over here. I didn't pinch him, I promise. Then I'll go there. Thanks. Um, so my one addition here uh, would be better use of the International Court of Justice for environmental cases and environmental issues. We already have some very good case law uh, the nuclear weapons test case, for example, uh, the, the Danube River case, uh, the Costa Rica Nicaragua one on dredging on the river, uh, which came out with the obligation for environmental impact assessments for any environment projects that might have environmental impacts on, on neighbouring countries. There's quite a lot that's already been achieved through cases in the International Court of Justice. We now have the one on climate through the advisory opinion. So one thing I suggest is better use of what the existing jurisdictional ways we have to get cases into the court. One of those is the advisory opinion approach. Um, another one is through uh, countries that accept the jurisdiction of the International Court of Justice for any legal dispute between them and others. Only 73 countries have done that so far. We want to get more and more countries uh, to accept the jurisdiction and see that as a something that will help them to be able to take you know, environmental cases to the court and help re resolve them. Um, and also to include it in environmental treaties, because that's the other way of getting to the court is to have a uh, jurisdiction of the court involved in environmental treaties. The One of the values of the, of, you know, the uh, judicial approach is that you've got the capacity to bring in the evidence um, and, and all, all parties are involved in that, have got that capacity to put that in. Uh, so that's the scientists, you've got the application of the law, and then you've got like resolution and solutions. So it takes it out of the more of the political realm um, and much more into judicial and, and problem solving realm. So I'd say better use of the International Court of Justice for environmental issues. Thank you. I think I saw Augusto raise his hand next. Um, let me take a slightly different angle on this interesting question. Uh, you know, for me, one of the big issues at the moment is how does one raise the resources to finance the transition to a renewable owner and energy economy? This is something that will take trillions and trillions of dollars over the next decade, decade and a half. And at the moment, you know, we are tinkering at the edges. We haven't really identified, you know, resources that are big enough in scale that would actually facilitate that transition. Um, one subject that has come up in, in, in discussions over the last decade is the introduction of uh, uh, financial transactions tax. This is kind of the original Tobin idea of 1972, which has gone beyond the tax on, on foreign exchange transactions and now looks at you know, the entire spectrum of financial financial sector transactions. And because the, the financial sector has grown in, in scale and debt uh, in huge ways, uh, a very, very small tax could actually generate enormous amounts of, of money. But for reasons which I cannot go into because we don't have the time, this the, the introduction of this tax would actually require um, for it to become an obligation of IMF membership, right? And for me, if we were able to do something like this, you know, the IMF has amended its articles a number of times in the last, you know, since the organization was created. It's not like the UN charter, right? 
uh, they have shown you know, more dexterity in adapting the organization to the needs of a changing world. If we did something like this, we would potentially generate vast resources, which could go some way towards uh, helping us address the problem of climate change, adaptation, mitigation, and, uh, and so on. Thank you. I don't think that I have ever seen so many high level ideas uh, presented so well in such a small amount of time frame. Congratulations to our panelists and thank you all very much.